everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel from their fathers, children of POWs, share stories and artifacts. I'm Kim Guise. I'm the curator of the guest of the Third Reich exhibit, um, which is in our special exhibits gallery across the street through July 7th. So I hope you all um, get a chance to see that if you haven't already. Um, guest of the Third Reich American POWs in Europe follows the 93,941 Americans who were held as POWs by Nazi Germany. Um, today, Memorial Day traditionally honors those Americans who lost their lives in service to their country. But the men we're here to discuss now, today, survived the war as prisoners. Um, it's an experience that had a profound effect on the rest of their lives and many of their lives were cut short because of their experience as prisoners of war. But these after effects were not limited to the servicemen alone, but they touched and impacted the lives of their families. So we've invited four family members and artifact owners here today to talk about the material that they've entrusted to the museum. They've shared parts of their lives with us, parts of their family, and I've discussed which e with each of them how precious these artifacts are personally, um, but also how historically significant they are as well. So I'd like to also mention, in addition to our panelists here, which I'll introduce in a minute, um, we also have several um, children and families of POWs in the audience as well that I'd like to recognize. Um, the Moore family here in front. I have Rob Gutenberg over there, um, Michelle Martello Reiner, and um, someone that I just met who happened to <laughs> just stumble in on this panel um, as well. So I'd like to mention um, everyone who's here. And hopefully we'll have time at the end for um, question and answer where we can hear from some of you in depth as well. So this panel um, will be presented in um, three parts. One, this introduction here. <laughs> um, but we have um, four panelists, and, um, and hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A uh, following the panel. At 2.30, um, we'll have the Victory Bells performing across the street in the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion. So we'll try to wrap things up so that everyone can have time to get across the street. Um, and then also following our panel, um, one of our panelists, Andrew Gabriel, will be signing his book, correct? Right outside here. Um, so if you have a chance, stop by, um, say hi to him, look at his book. Um, so Andrew is first up, so I will. I have a short, um, some short slides put together so you can see who they're going to talk about today. Oh, here's the exhibit. So Andrew's first up on our panel. He published in 2008, I told you about his book, um, he published A Diary of Hope, A True Story of an American Prisoner of War. And this is based on his grandfather's diary in World War II. Andrew's grandfather, Frank Carrillo, served with the 99th Bomb Group, the 8th Air Force, as a radio operator on the Flak Dodger. And the Flak Dodger was shot down on Carrillo's 49th mission over Austria in December of 43. He spent the rest of the war in Stalag 17B. Here you can see one of the artifacts that Andrew has donated to the museum. That's a prisoner of war postcard. So Andrew will be followed. I'll give a short introduction of everyone first. Andrew will be followed by the Worrell brothers, Bruce and Barry, um, who first visited the museum with their mother, who's in the audience as well, in 2011. And they all came together and donated their father's wartime log, which is seen here. Um, so it was a very special day for everyone involved and very emotional day as well. Um, the uh, uh, Mr. Worrell's wartime log can be seen in Guest of the Third Reich. We have several presented um, on iPads in the gallery. So you can flip through these and you can also see them on our website, guestofthethirdreich.org. So their father, Bruce L. Worrell, served with the 85th Infantry Division and was captured in Italy in May 1944. 
And Worrell's journal, Mr. Worrell's journal, is in many ways an exception to the others in our collection um, and the bulk of our POW material um, because he was part of a work detachment. He was part of Commando 1711, which was based out of Stalag 2B. So initially, um, most, the majority of P American POWs were airmen. Um, that changed at the Battle of the Bulge when large numbers of American infantrymen were captured. But, um, so there are a few wartime logs from infantrymen. So this is um, something a little different, and I'll show you. That's, I believe, the only picture that I had um, available. Your dad. That's from the wartime log that they donated. And then our final panelist, who's a local, um, Deborah Yenny, Deborah Miller Yenny, has shared with the museum an awesome collection from Stalag Luft IV. Her father, Willard C. Miller, that's him here, um, his nickname was Boo, right? Willard Boo Miller, um, served with the 96th Bomb Group as a B 17 waste gunner when his plane was lost in a mid air collision over Czechoslovakia on May 12, 1944. Um, later, as a POW in Stalag Luft IV, Miller served as the American prisoner representative, which they referred to as the man of confidence. So he kept not only the journal, um, but he kept extensive records on the 2,000 men in Compound B of Stalag Luft IV. Um, here are two pieces from Willard Miller, which, are also, which can also be seen across the street in the exhibit. So in which Jim Moore's father is referenced and Cheryl Jostad, who's sitting here, her father is also referenced in these works. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panelists and we'll try to keep on time so we have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So Andrew, would you like to come up, please? We're going to do this? <laughs> All right, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment for some acknowledgments. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the museum for having me here today for this amazing event, and to Jeremy, Lauren, Kim, and Chris for dealing with my constant emails, even though they have very busy schedules. <laughs> I'd also like to thank, of course, my dear family and friends who were able to join me here today, and those that couldn't. Without their love and support, it's hard to think that I would have completed this book and be standing up here to tell my grandfather's story today. Finally, I would like to take a minute to personally show my appreciation for the many veterans that are here with us today, with a special shout out for my grandfather, Rich Gabriel, who served the United States in the Korean War and who was more than willing to join us in beautiful New Orleans for this occasion. It is because... <laughs> It is because of your service and sacrifices for this country that we are here today at this museum in remembrance and celebration, so thank you. Now, I could start off by throwing a list of details at you about Sergeant Frank Carollo, but I thought it best instead to use the words of Rose Castucci, Frank's sister, who wrote the foreword of my book. We were a family of nine children. My brother Frank was the second child, the second son. He was the twin of a sister that did not survive. He would always say to me, you look at me and I know you're my twin. I would always answer him, yes, I know. This was a connection we shared throughout our lives, both before the war and after he returned home a changed person. Frank was extremely intelligent. He loved to write poetry and was always drawing. I can remember my brother playing records in our living room and dancing. He loved to dance and was very good. He had a happy life and that's how I try to remember my brother despite the lifelong scars that he'd suffered with from his time in the war. Scars that came back to haunt him in his last years while he fought a losing battle with Alzheimer's disease. In my heart and in my eyes, when I see that flag fly, I think of my brother with a proud fondness. When he died and was buried as a veteran in a veteran cemetery, and they played those taps and they folded that flag, I cried. I cried because I knew my brother had given his life for every inch of that flag. His diary is a testament to that, every word written in a hand that suffered so much for this country. I think Rose's words sum up Frank's early life and the changed person that he returned home as quite nicely. 
Frank's time as a prisoner of war indeed left him scarred, both physically and emotionally. Scarred by the dark, torturous memories of his time in Stalag 17b in Krems, Austria. You see, in the simplest of terms, and as many veterans can unfortunately attest to, he returned home to carry on his life with post-traumatic stress disorder. But life doesn't stop for debilitating depression. The years marched on, and life had to continue for Frank and so many others. My grandfather and his lifelong sweetheart, Dominica, adopted a baby girl in the years following the war, my mother, Mary Ann, who's also with us today. As time passed, she married my father, Raymond, and together they would have four children, me and my sisters, Giselle, Raina, and Anna. As kids growing up in the 80s and 90s, our grandfather's time in World War II was the farthest thing from our minds, for my two elder sisters and I. To us, the war was ancient history. What did it even matter anymore? What mattered was going outside to play and when our pop-up would come and take us out for one treat or another. And some days, I suspect, the war seemed to be the farthest thing from Frank's mind, too. But inevitably, that foreboding shadow would creep in from his memories and the depression would take hold. But what was, what was depression to a child? All we knew was that some days the happy, loving pop-up that we knew became an entirely different person. Consumed by the memories of watching comrades in arms, killed in the flaming wreckage of plane crashes, or starving to death in some distant camp. I distinctly remember one time during one of his many sleepovers, coming down into the kitchen for a drink in the middle of the night. While he slept in the living room, I can recall hearing him talking in his sleep, saying things like, get out of the plane, the plane is on fire, we're going down. Crazy old man, I thought. Again, a child with a child's cares and ignorance. My mom would lovingly tell us that Pop was having one of his mood swings, and that when the depression would set in, he was in a bad mood. Sometimes these bad moods would last as little as a weekend, while at other times they would be all consuming, at one time to the point where he even needed to be hospitalized. But what did that matter to me, though? I was just a selfish kid who was waiting for the next good mood to hit so that I can convince my pop to take me to the comic book store, even when my parents wouldn't allow it. I just wanted my pop, the man who bought me my first Indiana Jones movies back when he was in a good mood. And that's how it was for many years, never giving a second thought to the experiences that cause these mood swings. Now, in his diary, the Red Cross Journal, where he depicted his time leading up to and encompassing his time in Stalag 17b, parts of which are now on display within the museum. He had passed them on to my mother, and they were kept safe in our house for many, many years. Every once in a while, my pop, in one of his good moods, would pull the diary out and allow his kids to explore his time in the Stalag from late 1943 to May of 1945. Sometimes it was interesting especially when he found the courage to relive those memories and explain what was written on each page. Most of the time, however, it was boring for us, our young minds never taking in the enormity of what he had experienced. Unfortunately, it wasn't until much later, towards the end of Frank's life, that I had the maturity to really sit down and give his time in the war much thought. I can remember opening that old, worn, felt-covered book for the first time and truly taking in and actively comprehending every page and detail. For the first time, I was seeing my grandfather from a whole new light. Page after page, from his funny photos and stories of his time in basic training, to the horrifically detailed accounts of his bomber, which he called in the diary of the Flak Dodger, being shot down in the night skies over the border of Austria and Italy, illuminated only by anti-aircraft fire as he parachuted down. I've included a poem about this experience entitled The Last Flight, written by Frank and included in my book. <clears throat> Big birds filled with eggs of death darken the skies of day, and the enemy guns blow them breath to take their breath away. Chicks nestled neath her wings, each with a job to do, showing a courage known to kings as their guns spit a mad tattoo. Then through the din of the great bird's flight, a shot found her heart and slowed her down in her gallant flight 
as she fought to do more than her part. Then she cautioned her chicks to be ready, for her light was ebbing fast. Her course was unsteady, and then she breathed her last. Each chick leaped from the great bird's wing and held high with trembling hands that wonderful man-made silken thing that carried them safe to land. Now each chick had just one thought in mind, their time had not come to die. But they thought of the land they left behind and uttered a new kind of sigh. This poem painted the picture of the de devastating crash in Frank's own words. And to have actually experienced it, it, it must have been unbelievable. I then went on to hold actual Western Union telegrams in my hand that had been sent to Frank's mother, telling his family that he was first missing in action, then actually presumed dead before being confirmed as a POW. It made me realize the heartbreak that must have went through their hearts and minds. Reading the accounts of a bombing raid over the camp while he was in an infirmary, written on tattered scraps of toilet paper, he had actually written on scraps of toilet paper. That was the only thing available to him. Looking over the menu he drew of the meals in the camp made me ask myself if I could handle having merely bowls of hot water for dinner, or leaving the maggots in the bowl of barley you had been given for breakfast just to give yourself some extra protein. Finding myself nearly in tears by some stories, but then laughing out loud at the whimsical drawings and poems that he included, undoubtedly in an attempt to keep his mind and humor alive in this sinister place. I had found an aspect of my pop that I had never knew existed. I wanted to hear it from his mouth again, this time to listen and understand with intent. But by this time, life had thrown Frank another twist. He had suffered a fall, the shock of which had ushered in the mind-destroying disease of Alzheimer's. Seeing that his experiences would be lost to those of future generations, like my littlest sister Anna, who was only five when Frank passed in 2005, I decided to compile his diary into a book. I went to his sister Rose. I went to my uncles, my father's brothers, who had, he had told many stories to in the past, to recount the stories he had told them. I wanted to preserve this time in history the best I could understanding only full well that I would never have the chance to fix the unawareness of my youth and listen intently while he spoke about this time from his lips again. Within a few months, my wife Liz and I will welcome our first child into the world. And when the time comes that he or she, or my nieces and nephews ask, what was my great-grandfather like? I will tell them about his sacrifices as a soldier for our nation in World War II. I will tell them about his time as a POW overseas. I will show them the diary where he chronicled his hopes and struggles while in this darkest of places. Even more than that, though, I hope to impart this understanding to them, an understanding that I did not appreciate until far too late. I will tell them of a man who tried his best despite having depression from a time in a prisoner of war camp, who did his best to bring happiness and joy to all those around him. A man with a joke always at the ready and an endearing laugh to compliment it with. A sharp dressed gentleman who can sing and dance like a pro and regale you with stories of years gone by for hours on end. A man who you absolutely hated to go to a shopping mall with because he loved to talk to nearly everyone he passed by. A feisty son of a gun who never hesitated to rile up one of his oldest friends, Bob Haug, at the bi-weekly poker game that has been going on for the last five decades and still continues to this day. The type of man that would give his right arm and then some for his family, especially his grandchildren. A man whose love, caring, and guidance will live on in so many hearts for many, many years to come. A son a brother, a friend, an uncle, and a pop-up. Thank you.
Thank you. My name is Bruce Whirl, Jr. Uh, I was named after my father, and uh, my mom and dad tried to have children after he got back from the war for 10 years, and I think they were about ready to give up, and uh, then all of a sudden the best came along. Uh, My dad didn't talk about the war a whole lot or being a prisoner a whole lot until I was older. In fact, we didn't see the diary until both of us were older. Uh, he and I loved to hunt and fish and go places together and travel and watch ball games. Uh, and it was during those times that he began to tell us stories about what it was like uh, as a prisoner. Uh, he fought first in North Africa and then in Italy and he was captured there and uh, sent to Germany uh, on a train car and then marched. Uh, one of the things, he was injured playing football in high school. Uh, he was a b lot better football player than I was. Uh, but he hurt his knee very badly. And it was that forced march uh, to the Stalag that he feared the most. Because since he had injured one of his knees, uh, he knew very early on that if you fell during that march, uh, they didn't pick you up, you were shot on the spot. And yet he made it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk in just a minute about his love for hunting and fishing and the outdoors and all of those things because I think it resulted as a part of him being, uh, as he said, uh, cooped up in that prison camp for all that period of time. He loved, as he said, being free out in the open. And uh, he and I, my brother and I are going to take turns until they tell us to sit down. Uh, but one of the things he loved to collect after he got back home was pocket knives. And uh, I guess it was his way of saying, if I have to, I'll defend myself with this knife. And this was the first one that he ever got. And so uh, I carried in my pocket. Uh, we lost him about six years ago. Uh, he also had Alzheimer's uh, in his latter years, uh, along with a million other diseases and problems, including frostbite of his feet, which during the wintertime turned black. Uh, but uh, they manage, uh, uh, we heard uh, Lauren and Kimberly that he wouldn't live much past 60, 65. Uh, he left us at 87. So he had great care at the VA. And I'm gonna let Barry talk next. Well, I do want to thank uh, uh, Kimberly and Lauren for their hospitality this weekend and for allowing us to come and, and uh, share a little bit about our father. Uh, one thing that I want to talk about, uh, I should point out my brother's a preacher so he can talk without any notes for hours on end. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm a minister of music. I'm also an ordained minister, but I do music so I have to look at something, like a songbook. So, um, but anyway, just uh, I want to talk just a little bit about, um, uh, about what... Um, we kind of experienced as, as children. Uh, Dan was really a, a quiet, soft-spoken gentleman. And uh, as Bruce said, he loved sports. He loved the New Orleans Saints. He loved Mississippi State football. Amen. And, and uh, I'm sorry, Morris, but he hated everybody. That, he hated Ole Miss and, and I always pulled for anybody who played them. <laughs> That's just the way it is in Mississippi. 
But uh, anyway, he did, as Bruce said, he loved to fish and hunt and outdoors. And, and, uh, but some of the things that um, uh, Gabriel said, I think, is, is, is really uh, uh, the same as our father. When we were children, we didn't pay a lot of attention to the things that he did or said. But I was telling, uh, uh, and our mother's here, as Bruce said, and we're glad that she's come uh, with us and some of our family members. But uh, one thing that Dad was always noticed, he was very quiet. And uh, he was, um, of course, a great family man and husband, which are great examples to us. And uh, he was uh, known for being a Christian businessman. He was a guffaw jobber. He and my mom together for about 45 years. And, uh, of course, very active in church. And, of course, in our small Mississippi town, the, the, church, the community revolved around our church, so we were always in church. And uh, he was uh, singing the choir and played the organ and piano, and just a very musical man. He loved music. And uh, uh, that was really uh, very influential for us. Bruce has uh, learned to play the organ and piano, and he was, has a good voice. And, and, uh, uh, but he loved to talk more. He liked to sing, so he became a preacher. And uh, I kind of went the other way and, and became a church musician. And uh, that's something that uh, Dad always said he wanted to be, but there was no such thing back in those days. But uh, uh, some things that I guess um, kind of influenced us uh, more and more as we grew older is uh, as we realized that uh, the things that he went through, and of course, as Bruce said, we discovered his war log in the headboard of his bed one day, and uh, he kept it locked up pretty much all the time except when he wanted to retrace it. And uh, they had pencils. They didn't have any pens back in, when they were POW, so he wrote everything in pencil, and as it began to fade over the years, he would retrace it every so often. And uh, so it was during one of those times that we discovered it, and uh, uh, began to talk to him about it, and, and um, uh, they didn't, he didn't like to talk much about it. He was pretty quiet, but as he became older, he did discuss more things, and as Bruce said, kind of at random, he would tell th about this story or that story. But um, anyway, some things that he did, uh, he did experience was uh, uh, some mild depression. He took an antidepressant, and I'm sure a lot of the guys did uh, that suffered the uh, PTSD. And, uh, but along with the depression, he had uh, tremendous digestive problems. And uh, uh, then circulation, as Bruce said, was very, very poor. And uh, he had to give up hunting uh, in, the, in the extreme wintertime because his toes would turn black and he was always afraid he might lose them. So there was a lot of things that he, he dealt with over the years and, as Bruce said, multiple surgeries. And uh, one thing as a little boy I remember um, uh, distinctly was uh, we loved watching war movies. And anything related to that, like, you know, remember when Patton came out, and probably in the 70s, and and I said, Dad, let's go see Patton, you know, and, and uh, of course he fought under Patton, and he said, No, can't do that, and so he didn't he didn't watch anything with war or anything, and I thought that was kind of strange, but um, anyway, um, um, these were some of the things that kind of um, he dealt with, but the thing that I want to tell you today, uh, as I close my part for right now, is that we never knew him to be a weak man or uh, someone who kind of um, focused on himself. He just seemed like a typical father. Um, he did, uh, he was very quiet. I think that was partly due for the depression that he, he dealt with. And, uh, but he, he lived a, a very normal life. And I think with, of course, my mother and he knew that uh, they dealt with a lot of his issues of health when we were little boys. And, but when we grew up, he was just dad. Uh, he was uh, a lot of fun to be around. And, and uh, so I think he, he uh, really dedicated his life uh, after the war to be uh, a man of faith, a man of family, and uh, certainly a great example for us. He's sort of like uh, Duck Dynasty. Uh, faith, family, but it was ducks, squirrels, rabbit, deer, brim, bass, and on and on. We learned from our father how to give back to others. He was a very generous man. When he retired, one of the things that I want to do is when he retired, he didn't just go to fishing or sitting at home or well, yeah, he did that too. Uh, but he and my mom uh, went on mission trips. 
They built churches. They remodeled churches. They went everywhere from Florida Keys to Arizona, New Mexico, uh, remodeled old double wides so that people could have a church because out there they didn't have churches. Uh, I learned how much he cared for his family and how to care for my family. Uh, he got to, the day he left us, he got to spend the day with our family, me and my brother and our wives, which there's no girls in our family, so our two wives were his daughters. And uh, seems like uh, all I have is granddaughters, so he loved girls. And he got to see his great-granddaughter that day. Um, but he was so generous, and he taught us to be generous. He loved his country. I'll never forget the day uh, I was watching the Gulf War. You remember when Kuwait was invaded, and they were taking Kuwait back. Got a call from Mom. Uh, Dad was, I don't know if he was under a table or on the floor or whatever, but he basically kind of had a, a mini nervous breakdown. He could not stand the images. And I said, call the doctor. And, uh, but uh, anything that related to war, he could not watch, not even our country fighting. Uh, he was in favor of it. He marched in just about every... Veterans Day Parade there is. And uh, I have pictures, which I wish I had brought, of him standing in front of a World War II cannon that sat out in front of our courthouse. Uh, he thought that was everything, to stand out there in front of that cannon and have his picture made. Uh, I think one of the things I would tell you is, despite the vicious, viciousness of war, and he, he was a machine gunner, and always worried about what we thought about the fact that he took lives. Despite the fact that he was in a prison camp where a lot of people lost their lives, he was still a gentle man who loved his family. And like Barry said, our mom's here, and my children are here, and my grandchildren are here, because we thought this was a way to honor a gentle man. And the best thing in the world was to get one of his grandchildren up in his lap in the chair that I have in my room. And next to that chair was a wicker basket. And in that wicker basket were Snickers. And he ate them all day long. And when it was empty, he wanted more. And if he didn't have Snickers, that man ate ice cream like you wouldn't believe. And I think part of that was he helped us to be better men in the world in which we live. And if tomorrow they called both of us and said, we need you to fight for our country, we would do it because he taught us to love this country. Well, I think our time is drawing to a close, so uh, just a couple more things I, I wanted to share. Um, I think uh, our dad was uh, one of the lucky ones. Uh, he enjoyed life, as we've said, and I think you know by now. And uh, he, was, he felt so blessed in so many different ways. Um, and uh, so many of his friends did not come home, and I think he thought about them all the time. 
But he, uh, as Bruce said, and we keep saying because he was such a gentle man, a quiet man, and, uh, but he, he really did have uh, uh, many, many blessings I think he was thankful for. And as Bruce said, one of the things he has taught us is our love for country and uh, respect for the military and those who, who did get their lives. I'm sorry, he's supposed to be crying. I'm not the crier in the family. He is. I don't know why I am. I'm not crying. But anyway. <laughs> But anyway, he did teach us a great respect for, for God and country and, and uh, that we, we still have till today. And, and uh, one other thing that I think was, is noteworthy that probably is, is very typical of servicemen in, in, uh, today that uh, they don't feel worthy of what God has given them. And uh, I think that was uh, typified when, when he was, uh, I think, awarded the uh, Purple Heart. And refused it. And he refused it. Because he felt so many more paid such a higher price than he did. But uh, again, we're thankful for our dad and for our mom and uh, for our family. My name is Deborah Miller Yenny, and I too would like to thank especially Kim Geis for inviting me here today. It's such an honor. And I just want to say, as a citizen of New Orleans, I am so proud of this museum and the attention that it's drawn, not just in America, not just here, but across the world. And it has given all of us so much, and it's, it's such an honor to be here today. And I'm here with a couple of friends, and I'd really like to, to single one of them out. It's Mr. Charles Austin, who is a veteran of World War II. And I'd like to give you my personal thanks, Mr. Austin. His name is Willard Charles Miller, but he was known as Boo by everyone. He died on March 28, 1975. And unfortunately, I don't have any stories to share with you from a first-person point of view, because my parents divorced when I was very young. And after that, I didn't spend very much time with my father before he died. But prior to their divorce, I have a vivid memory of sitting in my dad's lap as he showed what at the time seemed to be a very large book with visitors to our home. I remember the book had hand-drawn pictures in it. I remember a box of buttons that my father told me came from the uniforms of what I referred to as army men. As time passed, I only had one clear image of the book in my head, a plane going down with smoke coming out of the back of the plane, and of course, the buttons. Prior to their divorce, we lived in the country, and my father, too, was a hunter and a fisherman. And he spent an inordinate amount of time wandering the woods, which maybe is a common thing with him, which I didn't realize until just today. But many days, he would leave early in the morning, and we wouldn't see him till late that afternoon. Or he would get in his pirogue and just paddle for miles and miles down the bayou. And I guess maybe that's what it was, looking for that freedom. I'm not sure. When my father died, I asked his sisters if anyone knew where the book and the buttons were and if I could have them. Everyone denied any knowledge of their whereabouts. Periodically, I would again ask family members about my dad's book and buttons. For 37 years, I asked about them, always hitting a dead end. However, my cousins did remind me that my dad was a prisoner of war, a fact I had forgotten since I was so young when they separated. And they also told me that he held some position in the camp. And they said he never talked about the war or his time as a PO, in the POW camp. With the advent of the internet, I searched records about my dad. I found out that he was a right-waist 
gunner on a B-17G with the 96th Bomb Group, 337th Bomb Squadron, and on May the 12th, 1945, which coincidentally was the day Stalag Lu 4 was opened, while on a mission to bomb oil refineries at Brew, his plane was lost. It wasn't shot down. It had its nose compartment blown off by the explosion of another B-17 directly beneath it. The navigator and bombardier were killed. And as a side note, just last week, a cousin gave me some more information from my father, which included three letters from the mother of the navigator written to my grandmother asking her if she had any news about her son. One of them was dated July of 1945 when my father was already home and they still didn't know anything about the whereabouts or the final results of what had happened to their child. All of the men in the back of the plane bailed out and were captured. The pilot, co-pilot, and engineer stayed with the plane, landed it, and were captured. My dad was sent to Stalaglu 4, where he was elected man of confidence in Compound B. He was in Stalaglu 4 until they were forced to march starting on February the 6th, 1945. His time as a POW ended at 3.30 p.m. April 26th, 1945. I know this because it was written on the first page of his wartime law. About a year ago, one of my cousins called me and asked me to meet her, but asked that I not tell any other members of the family about the meeting. When I walked into the restaurant, I saw a gray file box on the table and thought, could it be? But even then, I wasn't very optimistic. My cousin explained that the contents of the box belonged to me, but I couldn't ask any questions about where they had been or who had them. I readily agreed, and we opened the box. I was expecting the buttons since in my memory, the book would never have been, would have been much too large to fit into the file box. When I opened the box, I discovered a national treasure. Not only did the box include the book, but numerous records from the camp. It turned out that the book that I remembered as huge was actually about the size of a small novel. I immediately began looking at the pages of the book and found the one picture I clearly remembered and realized that the last time I had seen it, I was sitting in my daddy's lap. The box contained hand -drawn, a hand-drawn camp newspaper, the Creaky Chronicles, minutes of meetings with the Commandant, the agendas and meetings from meetings with the Red Cross representative and the YMCA representative, and many other records at the camp. I left the meeting with my cousin and went home to look at my dad's records more closely. The journey to get my dad's book returned to me was long, 37 years. The decision to give it away was much quicker. Within an hour of reviewing all the documents, I knew I couldn't keep them. They were not mine. They belonged to all Americans and needed to be kept safe. So the next morning, I contacted Kim Geis at the World War II Museum and asked if she thought the museum would be interested in the records. She said yes. Before I made the formal donation of the documents, I spent a lot of time studying them. I had family and friends come over to look at them, each time telling them they were looking at or holding a one-of-a-kind piece of history. Every time I showed the collection, I learned something new, but more importantly, I gained a little more insight into the contribution my father made to keep an important aspect of World War II safe for future generations. I had a lot of time to think about the importance of the documents and realized just how special my father's contribution to history was. When it was time to leave the camp, with only a few hours' notice, he gathered all the records and carried them out of Stalag Lu 4 with him. It was February 1945, one of the coldest, snowiest winters on record. Somehow he kept them safe and dry. I wonder how many times he looked at his package and thought, I could burn this paper and be warm for at least one night, or if he ever considered lightening his load and leaving some of it behind. I will never know what my father went through during his time as a POW. I was too young to remember any stories he told about it. But my journey to find the book and finally getting all the records ended with a tremendous gift to me, a deep appreciation for my father's sacrifice 
first country, admiration and pride in my father for being selected as man of confidence and leading the men in compound B, and his unwavering determination to keep the record safe for future generations to study. I am so thankful that the records were returned to me, that someone in my family kept them safe for 37 years so they could be shared with all of us. When I was a child, Staff Sergeant Willard Charles Miller, Boo, was simply daddy. But now I know he was also a soldier that served his country with dignity and valor and the giver of a gift of immeasurable value to be shared with our entire country so that we might gain some insight into the sacrifice that nearly 100,000 men made in the POW camps in Germany during World War II. So we'll have a little time for questions and maybe to hear from another few members of the audience if they'd like to share. Um, I would like to show you, however, a few um, additional, share with you a few additional images of some other special folks that have visited as well. Here we go. We have, um, first up, we have Jim and Mandy Moore. Um, who shared their father, um, Sam Moore's wartime log. So this is one of our newer acquisitions. It's not in the exhibit um, because we um, received it after uh, Guest of the Third Reich was already up, but it's very, um, you can see it pictured here, and we are thankful for every single piece, so thank you. Um, the, the great thing, another awesome coincidence or, or wonderful um, thing that we discovered after um, Receiving this as a donation was Sam Moore Jr. was with the 301st, uh, 341st Bombardment Squadron. He was on the B-17 Paper Doll, which was shot down on the 22nd of February 1944, in, um, and he was in Stalag Luft 4 and 6. Um, so we knew that um, Sam Moore was in Stalag Luft 4, so we went back, we went back to these documents here from Willard Miller and just looked up Sam Moore's name and indeed we found his name listed in the journal. Let's see, right here you can see way on the left under the, it's the alphabetical list we saw Sam S.G. Moore. We found his POW number which he had listed out, 1555. And there's this other number, 8-12, which was kind of a mystery. Um, we weren't quite sure what that meant. Um, in, we weren't sure what that meant in Willard Miller's register. But when we flipped back to Sam Moore's book, we found out he writes out here, and you can barely see it. It says, um, Barracks 8, Room 12, Stalag Luft 4. So that really confirmed you know, all of these pieces coming together. Um, really inform each other and help with research. And I think that these pieces are really invaluable for research in the, for researchers in the future. And then Willard Miller also had this page here on the right, which is we flipped to Barracks 8, um, Room 12, and um, it's a full listing of all of the men who were in that, that room, um, which um, Jim Moore remembered his dad keeping in touch with some of those men. You can see that noted in the journal here, um, the marks next to the, the guys' names or the ones that he had kept in touch with, I believe. So I wanted to share this picture. It's kind of dark, but this is um, Kevin and Jerry Bialot. Um, I didn't actually know they were coming to the exhibit. This was just the other day, this was, I think was on Friday, um, here at the museum, and I got a call saying that someone had um, a POW dog tag and they were looking for me. Um, so it's just the, the type of um, interaction that's happened um, over and over since the exhibit's opened. So it's sparked a lot of um, 
a lot of great interaction and have met a lot of wonderful people. Um, this is Helen Maglione, her dad's journal. Um, Joseph Veronek is also in the exhibit. She was here last week. And then there's a real live POW, former POW in the flesh, Loy Copeland. He um, uh, used to live here in town. And then down on the left, I have um, Dan Klein and his wife Jessica and their grandfather, um, Claire Klein, made um, the violin that you see right in that photograph. It's also, it was, it's in the exhibit. So they were able to visit. Um, then we have one of our staff members, um, Chrissy Greg Bainham, who's there um, on the right. And that's her grandfather-in-law, um, Jim Bainham, um, who lives in Florida, enjoys every second of it. Um, and then this is Chet Strunk, the guy with the blue cap on. He and his entire family um, and neighbors <laughs> visited um, back in November. So they also donated his wartime log. He was in Stalag Lift 3. Um, but also, again, that was too late for the exhibit. But we, we are very glad to have it. So I know there were a couple of questions. Um, I would like to open the floor up. Lauren has a microphone um, that she's going to bring around so people can hear and so we can record this. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, any of your fathers or grandfathers ever talked much about the day of freedom, the day that they were released from the camp what it was like, who came to get them, where do they go, how do they feel, and how do they get the news, and you know, that sort of thing. Well, in Dennis Warlong, I remember he, um, he wrote a whole page about that, and uh, he just said that, um, that uh, they were in the barn locked up, and of course the, the uh, Germans had left to run and, and, uh, as they were coming, and, and so he said he, he remembered um, one of the tankers, there was, I think, two jeeps and two light tanks that came to, uh, to liberate them. And he said that um, uh, so some of the men in the tanks began to cry. Of course, they just yelled and screamed and cried and, and laughed. And, and uh, so it was a really exciting time for them. I remember my grandfather saying to me, it took me a while to remember this, but he said that before the camp had been liberated, they were lined up and they lined them up for the express purpose of killing all of them before they were freed and they just started going down the line going down the line going down the line and but before thank god they got to his section they the troops had reached them and they were liberated i, I don't really know because I, as i said i was so young when my father, when my parents divorced the only thing i know about my father's liberation was in his journal he actually wrote down the day that they started on the march, and he has a listing of every place they went every day. And when he got on the train, and like I said, on the very first page of his journal, he wrote 3.30, April 23rd, 1945, ex-POW. That, that's all I know about how he was liberated. Um, Cheryl, um, your dad told a really incredible story about his liberation. I was fortunate enough to meet um, Mr. Glenn Joe's dad, Cheryl's dad. And he spoke several times here at the museum. And he told an incredible story about his liberation, but he said um, that it was the happiest moment of his entire life. I know you must have heard the story a million times. Um, he. And he said this in front of you and your sister. He said, um, you know, it was a happier moment than my marriage. It was a happier moment, a, a brighter moment in my life than the birth of my first child. And I know, you know, that's such a powerful statement. And, and to grow up knowing that um, is, did you want to say if a few words, Cheryl. I hate to put you on the spot, but. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, and um, he was liberated from Mooseburg, and uh, he did say that they could hear the sound of the tanks coming, but they told him to lie down, not to get excited, or they could get shot just before they were liberated. But he said the most exciting thing in his entire life was seeing the American flag raised over Mooseburg. 
and every time he talked about it, he got uh, a little bit teary-eyed, and believe me, my dad was not a crier, but that was uh, his most powerful memory. And uh, then, of course, when he saw the Statue of Liberty when they were on the, the boat coming home, so, with the ship. So, anyway, it was a, a huge excitement for him, so. I have uh, very little knowledge of my dad's POW days. He just wouldn't talk about it. So uh, one thing I do remember was the, the, the fact that they were uh, quite concerned that the Allied forces, that they would be bombed, that their, their chances of being killed by Allied bombs was quite, uh, quite great. And then uh, when the German flag came down over the camp, the American flag went up. Hi, I'm Kathleen Callahan from Baton Rouge, and when I made a reservation uh, about a month ago, I made it for three of us, my husband and me, and my dad, uh, who died three weeks ago uh, at age 91. He was a survivor of Stalag Luft One. I'm here with my youngest sister, Kelly Brown, who lives here in New Orleans. Our dad did talk a lot about his experiences, and he wrote a book uh, entitled Kriegi, an American POW in Germany. And uh, we brought him here to the exhibit last October, and he enjoyed that very much. And I would, you know, I'm sorry he couldn't make it today. I wish he had been. He would have enjoyed this. But um, I did want to ask, uh, all of our family vacations, nearly all of them were tied with visiting his friends from prison camp. And I was wondering if your dads did the same thing. They were lifelong friends, and, and my, our dad was the last to go, but, but they stayed in touch. Well, I know my grandfather, we have letters in his diary of people that he kept in touch with over the years. Um, I, I can't say yes or no whether he went to actually visit them afterwards or not. But, yeah. I know that he did on at least a few occasions, but he stayed in touch. He was a member of the Polar Bear, yeah. Polar Bear group. I don't know what that means, but uh, but also through the ex-POWs, yes, he stayed in touch. And in his diary is the names and the addresses. Of course, I'm sure those, a lot of those had changed, but he tried to keep up with as many as he could. I don't know. I just wanted to know uh, how long were each of uh, the gentlemen prisoners of war. My father was shot down on May the 12th, 1944, and he was liberated on April 23rd, 1945. So 11 months. Well, my grandfather was uh, late 43, December 1943. There was, I couldn't find an exact date, to May 1945. Our dad also was captured on uh, uh, May of 1944 uh, and liberated in April of 45, so 11 months. Yeah, and at around 12 months was the average um, length of internment for American POWs in Europe. It was much longer um, in the Pacific on the whole. So I'd like to also add um, that this is a foundation. We will cover the prisoner of war experience in a permanent way in um, our planned liberation pavilion, and that's slated for the next couple of years, I'll say that. Um, Lauren, I, I would, I'm interested to hear from, from Michelle. Michelle, if you wanted to share um, some stories about your dad, did, you, did he keep in touch with um, the men he was interned with? Uh, yes, actually he did, and um, one of them was a gentleman that he had thought had been killed um, while they were in the march. He was a prisoner of war for 27 months. He went in at 230 pounds in Kazarine Pass, and as a lot of his octopus buddies said, he, short, he fought the short war because three months later he was captured in North Africa, and it was brought through Sicily, which is not really good for an Italian, and then up th uh, did the march up into Germany. And 
during that march at that time was when he thought two of his buddies had been killed because just as you had mentioned, they had fallen. But he was able to get back in touch with them at a later date. Uh, but to answer your question about uh, the liberation, I was just reading that section in, in um, the book that I have written, but it's based on his memoirs, completely unchanged, and just stories of about how he is, just like all of our dads and all of the people here, there's everyday heroes, and you just don't even know people's stories. But he was talking about hearing the, the cheering, and at this point, he is down to 80 pounds from 230. He was um, drafted at the age of 23, and at this point, he's now 27. And um, hearing the, the cheering and that, and he wasn't able to walk, he had brushed his teeth with charcoal. He would cut off mold from cheese and bread, and that's what he would survive on. And when the army officer came over to help him, he asked the doctor if he would give him his bread, if he would help him get to get outside for fresh air. And he was just truly a survivor. When we talk about Hogan's P heroes, I don't know, how many of you all have seen Hogan's heroes? Yes. When I read my dad's memoirs, I walked outside and said, Dad, are you sure you don't have yourself confused with Hogan's hero? <laughs> the man, they, they took down a gate and hid it in a tunnel. They propped a gallon of water on a door so when the German officer wa walked in, it fell on top of him. They did anything they could to throw them off their game. And that's what he said was what got him through it was love of family his fellow comrades, humor, and anything that threw the enemy off their game. But there was also a semblance of respect. So on that day, when now that they're going to be taking them out, he said all of a sudden he heard all of these guns firing again. And I won't tell you the exact words that are in the book, but it was all blank. The blank Germans are blank back, and something like that. And what he found out, what they told him, was that the Russians were up in the watchtower and were celebrating by shooting the guns off that were up in the watchtower. And then you start hearing more laughter because the other Russians were taking saw cutters and had cut down the supports of the watchtower while their buddies were still shooting up top. So it was just a huge celebration, but it obviously it took several months for them to recuperate enough to make it back to America. And, you know, much like when we went through Katrina, and I thought, you know, here's a man who's been through flashbacks, 27 months of POW, 25 years of fireman, 15 years of policeman. How much more can people endure? But they do. And always finding the humor in, in everything that he did, I think, was part of what got him through it, including that day of liberation. It was all about just one more day. Thank you, Michelle. That's one thing that surprised me when um, first working with this material is that the um, material in the wartime logs, the journals that were kept in the camps, um, it's pretty funny. Um, there's a lot of really um, humorous uh, stories in the journals, cartoons, um, jokes, dirty jokes sometimes. Um, so that was one thing I think that kept many people going. Um, and those can all be read in their entirety in the exhibit. Anyone else? Any questions? I just want to say uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, family's experiences uh, through this war. I think it's just uh, one of, as a student of history myself, this is uh, something that I really wanted to, to come to, and I'm so glad I'm here today because it's so important to hear their stories, and especially through their families. So I just want to say thank you so much. It's a really wonderful experience. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to underline that. So thank you again for your generosity in sharing um, artifacts and stories. I think you were talking about how your dad was a very generous man and taught you to be generous, and I think that shows. Thank you all for coming. Um, like I said, we're having the Victory Bells performance in the uh, 
Louisiana Memorial Pavilion at 2.30, and Andrew does have the book uh, with his grandfather's diary, and he'll be right out to the right um, in this Victory Theater lobby. But if you could please help me once again thank the panelists and Kim for this panel. Thank you.